Gone are the days um, when young people will sit and watch lots and lots of TV. Those, da- those days are gone. They, they won't just come back from school and just turn on the TV and then spend the next five hours, uh, six hours watching TV. Uh, they sit there and they watch YouTube. And they, they watch YouTubers. And they watch blog- vloggers. Yeah, vloggers, right? Rather than, because it's a video blog. Um, they enjoy watching people playing video games rather than, than actually playing video games. They will watch other people playing video games. They watch Minecraft videos, which last hours and hours and hours of somebody playing Minecraft. I'm like, wouldn't you prefer to play Minecraft? No, we'll just watch what this person does. There are box opening videos. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we've got some agreements. A hallelujah over there. We've got an amen. There are box opening videos where, where they'll, somebody will just buy something and then they'll open the box while people are watching and then they commentate on it and they go, this, this is what I'm doing, yeah, I'm sure. Um, you've made those videos, Joel. Okay, so this preaching is right for you. It seems that young people enjoy hearing other people's experiences, that they like listening to what other people are thinking, what, they've, what they're, they're thinking about this thing that they're opening or this thing that they're doing. And guess what? When we sit down over a coffee with friends, uh, like this uh, Friday night, we were sat for about five hours talking with a couple that we love very dearly, and it just, it just carried on, carried on. By the time we, we looked at the clock, it was like almost midnight, and we were like, we're still here, just talking about life. We were talking about our experiences, we were talking about our week, we were talking about holidays, we were talking about our purchases, we were talk- talking about the good things and the bad things, because guess what? Not only do the young people like hearing and talking about their experiences, but everybody likes talking and hearing about their experiences. When we come together, we're generally reviewing things, either for good or for bad. We're saying this this was good or that was really bad. This restaurant I went to was amazing. That restaurant I went to, the service sucks. We enjoy reviewing stuff and we enjoy, and, and much of our communication is about reviewing stuff. Guess what? You are a promoter. You're a promoter. You are a natural born promoter. You are a natural born reviewer. And if you can get paid to do that, then, then all the, uh, quite often I would, I would um, dream about the greatest job of all times. And it, and it would be those travel shows where they pay people to go on holiday and then review it. Jill Dando. I always, I always thought that this, this is the dream, you know, to get paid to go to Disney World and then just, just, just do a quick review on it and you're like, paid holiday. That would be the best job ever. So it's nothing new reviewing things. It's nothing new giving our view, giving our point of view, whether that be good or whether that be bad. Funny enough, for millennia it's been going on where people have been discussing what they view of things and what they think of things, and they've actually been putting it into books. Books are just basically people reviewing something that's happened, or their view of something, or they've collected information and it's always their spin on it. Books are basically reviews. Plato, he observed that books allow authors to meet people living long after the author himself. They communicate thoughts over great expanse of time and space and even beyond death. That's what what a book is. You write a book and it's it's your review of, of a certain topic and you just put it all together. You know what, your life is a review of sorts, a book to be read perhaps, of everything you've done and clearly everything you can remember. (laughs) To communicate to others what has made your life work. Paul said, you guys are the the result of our work. You know, we've we've been writing on your hearts and you are the evidence. They're, They're books to be read, we are all books to be read. So I was reading a book, I was reading the book of Jeremiah and It's a pretty intense book. It's the dark days of the nation of Judah. Um, There are some depressing books in the Bible. There are some tough reading in the Bible. Jeremiah Lamentations, just just in the the name itself, just brings you down. Jeremiah is is a major prophet. And uh, and basically what has happened is that um, from the beginning of, of, of God taking the nation of Israel, taking them out of Egypt with the exodus... Um, establishing them in the promised land. Um, He always, from the beginning that he gave the law, he said to them, 
if you honour me, you obey me, you, you follow me, if, if you walk with me under my covering, my, my love and my protection, then my love and my protection will be there. But if you don't, if you go with the other nations and you do what the other nations did and, 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 and you follow after them and you, you, you depart from me, then my love and my protection will, you know, you will choose to come out from that covering. And then when that happens and you follow in all the messed up stuff that the nations have been doing, well, then the, the, the land itself will kick you out. And God is faithful to his word, right? So even in the good and the bad, he's faithful to his word. You know, good parenting is being faithful in your word. When, when you say you're going to do something, you do it, even if it really hurts. And God is a loving father, and he says, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what he does. So the nation of Israel are facing that expulsion, <laughs> that red card. They're going to get kicked out of the land. They're divided in two nations, the nation of, of Judah, the nation of Israel. Israel is taken previously by the nation of Assyria. They come in and they wipe the, the land of Israel. And the, the, the nation of Judah remains. The, 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 the throne of David, the, the kingship, the line of kings of David. And they've seen their older brother, Israel, get taken into captivity. And 100 years keep going and they're still messing around. And so Jeremiah, long list of the prophets, and they're all saying, guys, stop messing around, follow God. If you follow God, then, then, then his mercy will, will, will not allow the judgment to take place because his mercy is, is, is bigger than his, his, his judgment. But he's faithful to his word and he will fulfill his word. So Jeremiah Lament Lamentations, it's a real messed up time because this is the last time that the nation of Judah is going to be there before Babylon is going to come and they're going to completely wipe the land of them. But there were lots of people saying, no, no, it's not going to happen, it's all good, it's all good. And Jeremiah's saying, no, actually, it's not good. Judgment is coming, we need to react. And so, in those final days, Jeremiah has a message and he says, God has spoken to me and we now need to do something which is unheard of. We need to defect to the, to the, the people of Babylonia. They're going to come and they're going to destroy. And there is pestilence and there is death and there is sickness and there is disease and there is the sword and there is abandonment and there is, you know, it's all coming. But if you give your life over, if you follow the word of God, which is now hand your life over to the Babylonians, then you will survive. Look, it says here, Jeremiah 38, verse 1. Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, this is what the Lord says, whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. Whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. They will escape with their lives. They will live. And this is what the Lord says, this city will certainly be given into the hands of the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. Later on, he repeats it. He says to the king himself, Zedekiah, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says. If you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and the city will not be burned down. Give yourself over and the, the city will survive. It won't be destroyed. You and your family will live. But if you will not surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, this city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians and they will burn this mother down. You yourself will not escape from them. You will not escape from them. It will be destroyed. And guess what the king did? He said, no, let's not defect the Babylonians of the enemy. God is on our side. He's not going to want us to do that. And a whole bunch of false prophets, the idiots, they stood up and they said, no, God is with us and this city will not fall because this city is the pinnacle of his eye. This, this is the greatest city ever known. We are the greatest people ever known. And unfortunately, God was speaking through this word of destruction is coming, but this is the lifeline. This is the way out. In all of that super depressing book, there is a hope. Because with God, there is always a hope. Even when judgment is about to come crashing down on the nation, God still gives hope. And unfortunately, the nation of Judah rejected God's word. We see later on that Jerusalem was destroyed. Judah followed its elder brother, Israel, and it was taken into captivity. 
And Zedekiah and all his family, they did die. It was a terrible tragedy, but they had an opportunity. Noah declared it with a massive boat. Something is coming. (laughs) What are you doing in the middle of the desert building that thing? What is that? Well, I think it's going to rain. Really? What? Like, why? You know, how long did it take for them to build that boat? That was a a huge declaration of something that was going to happen. Nobody took notice. Noah would have been, you know, they would have been asking questions. He said, well, God's told me this is going to happen, and they probably just all laughed at him. Joseph explained the dream to Pharaoh. Famine is coming. Famine is coming for the whole nation, and I just suggest you put a godly man in charge who can do something about this. The famine is coming, but God gives hope. With the Egyptians, God continued to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Let my people go. Don't do this. Don't let your, your whole Egypt be destroyed. Let my people go. Let my people go. And Pharaoh just said no. He hardened his heart. No, 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 no. Like Batman. No, 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 no. Those that have seen Lego Batman. No, 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 no. This, this was his heart. Just said no. Whatever God was doing, said no. God, he brings his judgment Because he is a just God. And sin brings judgment. The wage of sin is death. Death is coming, people. Death is coming. You're sure? Winter is here. Winter is coming. It's, you know, death is coming. Destruction is coming. But God gives hope. There is always hope. He always advises what he's going to do. And he always gives a lifeline. Even Jesus said, this place is going to be torn down. And again, he spoke of Jerusalem, and he said, there's not going to be a rock left upon another rock. You know, God always gives a heads up. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31, because I want to talk about this hope, this lifeline. God always lets his people know what he's going to do. He reveals it to his people. There is a hope, there is a lifeline, there is a way that God will give. He will always give. And Jeremiah speaks about it right here. Chapter 31, verse 1. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword... The people who survived the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again. Those that survived the sword will find rest in the wilderness. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I will build you up again. And you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels. (laughs) 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 Your tambourines. (laughs) And go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen will cry out. On the hills of Ephraim, come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Three things that I see in this uh, line that God is always giving. That that judgment is coming. And guess what? That judgment will not be stopped. It's not going to be stopped. Everyone who dies... You will face a judgment. There's, 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 no, there's no alternative to that. We're all, the Bible says it is given for a man to die once and he will come face to face with his judge. He will be judged. She will be judged. We're all going to be facing a judgment. That's, that's basic Christian doctrine right there. There is, there is the, the resurrection and then there is the judgment. Final judgment. So there's no way around that. In the same way that Noah was building the boat, the rains were going to come, they were going to come. In the same way that destruction was going to come to all the nations, Jeremiah says, destruction can come, but there is a way out. Now, 
it does differ what they have to do, but the key is they have to be obedient to God. It differs what they have to do. And this was, this was novel to the people of Judah when they said, give yourselves over to the Babylonians, go and, and, and make a life there wherever they take you and you will live. That was new to them. They hadn't understood that and that's why probably they rejected it. It was new to them. They rejected it. We quite often reject the new. <laughs> but the point is to be obedient to what God wants us to do. That's where life comes from, being obedient to to what God says. My first point, he makes a way. He makes a way. Jeremiah 31, 2, the people who survived the sword, they're the ones who accepted the way. They survived the sword. The sword came, the judgment came, the guillotine fell, and those that survived the sword, that's the way, people. There is always a way. You will find favour in the wilderness. I will come to give Israel rest because our God saves. We have a saving God. We have a, a God who, who, who saw the destruction coming and he loves us so much that he says from them there's no way that they can, they can create a, a, a saviour. There's no way that of themselves they can save themselves. They're all screwed. So... Somebody perfect has to come. Somebody in the form of a man, because a man gave it all over and handed all the authority over to the enemy. A man has to come and, 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 and take it back. And there's only one who's perfect, and that is God. So God came in the form of a man, and he came to die. He came to serve, and he came to die. Because the wages of sin and the judgment is there, but God is a just God and will, will have his judgment but his mercy is more powerful. It's stronger than his judgment. So when Jesus came to die, that is God's way. Whatever you're going through, whatever is happening in your life, God will make a way. He'll make a way when there is no way. He'll move a mountain if necessary. He'll bring the mountains down and bring the valleys up. He will make a way. Way in the wilderness. He'll make a way. God makes a way, no matter what you're going through. For those that walk in obedience, the enemies are behind Israel and God opens the Red Sea. The enemies are in front of Israel and the, the, the walls of Jericho fall down. God makes a way. He always makes a way. Israel faced genocide. <laughs> Not the first time, huh? They faced genocide. And Esther goes and walks into the king's chambers. It's a death sentence. She could be killed at any moment. She's taken a, a, a position that doesn't correspond to her. She steps in and the king extends his scepter towards her and says, Esther, how can I help you? She says, my people are about to die. And she intercedes for the people. I really love the intercession for what God's going to do. We need to pray. We need to intercede. Esther intercedes for the people. God makes a way. Mordecai, her uncle, says to her, God will surely make a way. If it's through you, then he'll do it through you. But if not through you, he'll raise another. Because God always makes a way. And don't think you'll escape the judgment if you don't be obedient. God makes a way. Guess what? Death does hold sway over our lives. A death sentence because of our sin. And we've all sinned. Nobody can stop it, nobody can evade it, but Jesus arrives and dies for us, so we have survived the sword. He makes a way. He is the hope of the world. His death and resurrection mean that we can now have an intimate relationship with God. Jesus is the way. My second point, not only will he make a way, God is the way, Jesus is the way, but he is also, he's, he's not just the door, but he is, my words have gone. He's not only the entry point, he is the travelling companion. He's not only the way into salvation, he is salvation himself. When God makes a way, it's not just a finished product. When you receive Jesus into your heart and you walk through that door, he doesn't beam you up to heaven and that's it, game over, 
and, and, and nothing left, you know, and everyone else is going, where did they just go? Where did they just disappear? Because they came to know Jesus and immediately they're in heaven. That's not the case. You come to know the Savior, you come to know the way, and then you walk out the way. Because Jesus is not only the way, he is the truth. He doesn't just want to get you to walk through whatever you're going through. He wants to establish you with what you're going through. It's not, he, he quite often is not just going to pluck you up from the middle of a problem and pop you on, on, on some place else where there is no problem. There are times when he is your deliverer and he will pick you up and plop you down there. But imagine if he just did this with all, all his children. And that's all he does all the time. God, God doesn't work like that. He says, I will be with you in the storm. I'll be with you with what you're going through. But not only will I be with you, you will plant your vineyard. You will build your houses. You will find rest in the wilderness. You will be established. Whatever you're going through, it's not just for you to get through it and get out the other side and go, phew, I've made it. He doesn't just want you to survive. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be established. Now, how are we established as the children of God? We are established on truth. It's his word that sets us free. It's his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Heaven and earth will go, all of this you see, this is all temporary, but my word is permanent. The wise man built his house upon the what? Upon the rock. Upon the word of God. Because this is the man that when the rain comes, and the judgment will come, when that rain comes, he built his house upon the rock, upon the word of God. We are established in truth. The person who doesn't have truth will just be waved around by the wind and the waves. They're just knocked all over the shop. But those that are firmly planted on the rock, when that wind and that rain comes, you stand. That house remains because it's on the rock. You see, God doesn't just save his people. He reveals himself to his people. And that is the truth. That is God revealing the truth. When he takes them through the Red Sea, he's saying, I am your protection. I am your cloud. I am your fire. I am your tabernacle. I am, your, I am the presence of God in the midst of you. I am the God that accompanies you. I'm the God that watches over you. I'm the God that guides you. When you're facing hurt and you're facing pain and you're facing hardship and trouble, I'm the God who comforts you. Jesus said, I am. Whatever you need him to be, I am. I am your comforter. I am your friend. I am I'm the lover of your soul. The God who watches over Israel. I have loved you with an eternal love. Isn't that God revealing who he is? That's truth. The more that you know God, the more that you are, are seeing who he is. His truth is revealed. You are established through knowing who God is. If you don't have the discipline of reading the Bible, you are missing out on understanding who God is. You are missing out on being established. And you could be knocked around by any doctrine. We are established through truth. Jesus is the way. Guess what, people? Jesus is the truth. I am the way, I am the truth. He wants to reveal himself to you no matter what you're going through. He is the firm foundation. John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That's Jesus in us, the truth. So he is the way, he is the truth. God will always make a way. God will establish you in whatever you're doing as long as you're walking in his truth. And my third point is that whatever God is doing in you, whether that be salvation, whether that be, be accompanying you during a really tough period of your, your life, whatever phase or, or difficulty, whatever God is doing with you, and hey, we all have our difficulties, we all have our issues. He's not just doing that for you. 
Because God isn't individualistic. He's a personal God that will look at you and his eye is placed upon you and he loves you individually. But he's not forgetting about the rest of the world and is just focused on you. I mean, I do want to make it quite clear that I'm his favourite. I do want to make it quite clear that when I pray with him, God, it seems that God puts paws on everybody else and is just, just listening to me. And that's my belief. I'm like, hey, you're, you're with me right now, yeah? You're just spending time with me, right? So, so just make that quite clear. I'm his favourite, all right? I'm sorry about that. You guys have to accept that. Yes, he is a personal God. And yes, he will deal with everybody personally. But he's a God of nations. He's a God of the peoples. God so loved Ollie, that he, God so loved the world. God so loved the world. The gospel is universal. It's, it's for everybody. Jesus died for everybody. You see, what God is doing in your life, when he, when he makes a way, when he establishes you through truth, the whole idea is that there's collateral blessing. Collateral damage is when people get hurt who weren't supposed to be hurt. There's a bomb that goes off aimed at an enemy and unfortunately other people get hurt. Not intended. You know what? When God blesses you and me, what what he's thinking is that I want collateral blessing to hit everybody around you. I want to get everybody. Maybe that blessing you think wasn't meant for them. That's my blessing right there. Hey, that's my blessing. You you give me that blessing back. That's mine. But God says, no, I'm going to hit you with such a blessing I'm going to open the floodgates of heaven over your life. You're going to be so blessed. And you know what? That hits you and it, and, it, and it just bounces off and starts hitting other people. And other people start going, wow, the fact that you're in this office brightens my day. The fact that you're in, in this university, you're in this school, and, and for some crazy reason you're, you have this smile on your face and this song in your heart. What is wrong with you? Why are you so happy? Why is there such joy in your life? Collateral blessing. We need to be a people of collateral blessing. We need to be so blessed that you can't contain it. And that the world knows. That's why it says, sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Let the nations know that God is good. Let the nations know that we have salvation in our King. Let the people know. Let your neighbours know. If you haven't done it already, please invite your neighbours to your house for a meal. Get to know them. Start blessing them. Start blessing them. Are you blessed because of... You know, we, we, we talk about the restaurants we love and the, and the, the things we've opened. <laughs> and I can, I, can, I can go hours talking about the things that I love. Well, surely that should be talking about Jesus because that's the biggest thing in my life. The thing that I love, the biggest thing. When people talk with me, somehow I'm going to get Jesus in there. I'm going to ask people, how was your weekend? So that they, answer, they ask me, how was your weekend? Oh, it was great. We had a great time at church. It was awesome. Really? You go to church? Yeah, it's awesome. Freaking awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that to talk about Jesus. Because the minute they ask me, open season, people. Open season. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna, gonna just start go, going off, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Do you need Jesus? I'm gonna start a relationship, and from that, I'm, I'm gonna start sowing seeds. And hopefully, there'll be some collateral blessing. That people say, yeah, that something is happening here. Moses didn't go through the Red Sea on his own, Joseph didn't just save his own family, the nations were saved. Esther didn't just save herself. Genesis 22, 18, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Through your offspring, through us. Through Jesus, he's the first offspring. But because of what he's doing in us, Jesus says, right, you're going to go and do bigger things than I even do. Yeah, right. (laughs) We're supposed to walk and we're supposed to bring collateral blessing. Because guess what? Jesus isn't just the way. He's not just the truth. He is the life. 
And that's what God wants to bring to this region. That's what he wants to bring to this city. What he wants to bring to this people. He wants to bring the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to be a people of blessing. Whatever he's doing in you, it's not just for you. I want to make that quite clear. And if it was just for us, then I think that God would, well, I would expect it to be very different. I would expect, well, I don't know. My, my, I try to get my head around God and I just can't. But I definitely have my, my thoughts, my silly thoughts, my futile thoughts. But when I recognize that God is, is more than just me, that he is looking at a people, at a community, and he's saying, I've got so many people in that city that still don't know me. That's, that, was, that was the word he gave to Paul. I've got people in this city. And it's your job to reach them. <laughs> Collateral blessing. 